the type of day job or business where I would get paid to travel the world and help people. And to help people achieve their goals, live their dreams, increase their performance, those types of things. So I know that my business is doing good in the world. Um, from that, my dream was to be able to take all of the abundance that my business creates and take that abundance and literally pay it forward to other people who need it. And whether that's a nonprofit, whether that's people who live in a village, whether that's a community, whether that's family or friends, but to find a way to be almost a channel and a vehicle for abundance and wealth to flow through to say, hey, they showed up in my life, who else needs it? Oh, you need some? No problem. Here you go, here you go, here you go. Let me pass this on for you. And whether that abundance is finances, knowledge, health advice, insights, life advice, um, a certain situation or an experience of life, whatever that abundance is that flows through me, my goal was to be that channel that it could flow through to obviously benefit myself, my family, all the ones I love, but then to pay forward and share with everyone else who really needs it in their own way, shape, or form. You were, uh, you were told you had four days to live when you got sick in Africa um, at one point in your life. How did that affect the rest of your life? Sure. It was actually five days to live. Um, <laughs> the extra day counts. It makes the whole thing different. Uh, but it, it was a time in my life I was living in a village in Uganda I was teaching organic farming. There's no running water, no toilets, no electricity. It's a rural farming Ugandan village. And it used to be a coffee plantation. Um, some people came in and sold them pesticides that literally killed the entire coffee crop, poisoned the land, destroyed their ability to make any type of income in the village. And I was there as a volunteer teaching them organic farming to how to regrow their land, how to re-nourish what they have, bring it back to life, and bring their local village economy back to life. And most people there lived in a mud hut with a thatch roof. And while I was there, I got malaria twice. Uh, the second time I got it, I, I, I was being stubborn and blunt. Uh, I think I had three or four doctors telling me to take the medicine. I told them my body will heal itself. My mind is powerful, and I believe. <laughs> they all laughed at me. Um, and one of them finally, as a scare tactic, sat me down and said, listen, let me show you what it looks like. They took a live sample of my blood. They threw it up on the screen in front of me. They said, see these little things? He said, this is, this is malaria. And I was like, what's that? And he said, well, every eight to 10 hours it hatches, it explodes out of that cell, and it kills that cell of your body. And he says, the rate you have, you have 55,000 parasites per one red blood cell right now. He says, every eight to 10 hours it doubles. Within five days, it'll eliminate so many cells that uh, that'll be it. And me being stubborn, looked at him and said, it, what, it for what? Like, then I start over, where do I go from there? And he's like, no, your body will be un, you know, unable to sustain itself at that point. And I remember hearing those words, and I don't think anyone has the right to tell anyone on this planet that you only have so many days left. Because who knows? Miracles happen, beautiful things happen, all kinds of stuff happens. And, but I remember hearing that thought, and it kind of shaking me. And it took something that felt that his life was limitless, which we're on the verge of science right now, thanks to the futurists, um, people like Ray Kurzweil, where because of 3D printing, because of DNA advancements, because of what's going on in the world, the generation that's listening to this, the teens, um, they'll be alive when there's a possibility of death being an option no longer mandatory. And what that means is they're going to be able to replace so many parts within the human body that if your heart goes out, they can replace it. If your liver goes out, they can replace it. You lose an ear, they can replace it. And there'll be a decision having to be made in history at some point, which is how many parts can we replace and still call it human? Now, this might sound like Star Trek sci-fi weird stuff, but that doesn't exist right now. So when I heard I have five days left to live, I looked around and go, oh, shoot. <laughs> and what it caused me to do is realize that bucket list I had of all these amazing things I always wanted to do somewhere in my life. I'm like, dang, I didn't get to most of those. This is not cool. And I went back and I, I developed something called a live it list, which is just putting a simple timeline on what I want to do now so that if I were to go out tomorrow, it would give me the space to look back and be like, wow, I really did it. I'm really proud of myself. It also caused me to rewrite my values. Instead of looking for these big, giant, huge, amazing things down the road, just as an, an, an ulterior perspective, it caused me to say, how do I live today? in a way that if there was no tomorrow, I would be so fulfilled 
so alive, so filled with meaning and purpose, and so connected to who I was that day that nothing else would matter. That if I were to die that day, I would know that I loved, I would know I lived, I would know I mattered, I would know I made a difference in some unique way in this planet, and it was just based on my simple day-to-day -day living. And so it transitioned my mindset from thinking about my huge bucket list down the road to all of a sudden, how do I make today the most magical experience of my entire life? You know, and, and as I look at this, I think this is a perfect kind of segue into this question that came up, um, is, you know, we have such an issue with, with teenagers using and abusing heroin and other drugs, um, and everything in life really is about decisions. So although each situation is a little different, um, is there a general message that you could send to the teens about this decision-making process? Absolutely. I never forget. I was being interviewed on a radio show on Eminem's network um, in New York City, and I'm trying to remember the name of the show. It was Rude Jude. And they had me sign this waiver when I walked in the room that basically said, he can ask me anything, and I will not sue them. <laughs> and little to say, the first five minutes of the show was pretty off the wall. I forgot on XM radio, satellite radio, you can cuss, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so these guys were literally insane. Awesome, fun crew, but insane. And I remember at the end, a caller called in and said, listen, I want you to get Rude Drew." Jude, or whatever his name was, to stop taking drugs. Okay, life coach, you fix him. And I'm sitting there thinking, logically in a business move, it's not smart to go against the host of a radio show, especially when it's their show. They're going to blast you. And then I thought about it. I said, but wait a second. What's the truth? I said, if I were to think about this for a second, what's the absolute truth? The truth is, how can I tell someone what they're doing is right or wrong? I can't. Who am I to judge? Everyone has their moments. And I said, but what do I know to be true about every human being on this planet? And I said, every human being is either an example or a warning through everything they do. I'm not here to judge you and tell you that if you're on drugs, if you're doing something that, oh, that's wrong, you shouldn't do it, and I'm going to fight you. Whatever you resist persists. If I come and fight you, you're going to try to prove to me why you're right. But if I just say, listen, according to my life, according to my vision of who I want to be and how I want to experience life, Right now, through my perspective of looking over and what you're doing, if you're on drugs, if you're doing this stuff, I need to say, listen, based on who I want to be, are you an example that's going to help me become more of that, or are you a big-ass warning of what not to do? And I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, according to who I am, where I'm going, and what I'm trying to accomplish, you'd be a warning in that moment. Therefore... I, I can't follow what you're doing. I can't listen to what you're saying. It's going to be very difficult to connect with you because what you're doing is taking me to a place that says, listen, that's not who I want to be. And if you're a position who's looking around in your life and all you've seen is warnings but thought of them mistakenly as an example, the people who led you to drugs, the people who led you to these places, look around and find an example. And here's one of the most important lessons I ever learned. Every single human being you meet has moments of being an example and moments of being a warning. Look at the homeless people around you. They're probably a warning of what to do financially to some extent because that's where they landed up. That doesn't mean they're not an example somewhere else. A lot of them are an example of community. If you ever hang out with them for a day, you'll realize how much they care and love each other, how much they take care of each other, how much they're there for each other. Learn that from them. Avoid the drugs. <laughs> if that makes sense, learn where to pick up the example from and where to pick up the warning from. And if you can really, really get good at that, filtering what is an example and what is a warning according to your life vision and who you want to be, it'll give you amazing perspective on the world around you. I think that is such an important uh, distinction and, and lesson for all of us to be able to take. So thank you for that. Um, you know, let's look at your, at your JRC TV um, that you put out on Tuesdays via YouTube. Um, and you really, you know, serve a great purpose with this. Um, and teens in particular are starting to develop their true personalities. Will this, um, will there be any content that you're tailoring specifically towards teens, or is the, the, the content going to be for people of all ages on there? Got it. So I, I made the mistake at some point in my history to stop differentiating between teens and everyone else. <laughs> um, if you're 13 years old, I don't see you as a teen. I see you as an adult maturing into who you're going to be. And I, I treat you that way. I talk to you that way. I don't, I don't believe in teaching someone who's young being like, oh, you guys aren't quite ready yet. Oh, there's so much going on in today's world that these people, 
young, old, whatever, need just as much advice. I put people in the categories, and the main category we will focus on is people in transition. If you're in transition in any area of your life, if your health is transitioning, if your relationships are transitioning, if you're transitioning from school to you know the next grade or the next degree, if you're going from school to you know jobs or work or entrepreneurship, in any transition like that, that's where we fit in. We help you redefine your vision. We help you take that vision and make sure that it's a simplified vision where no matter what you achieve, it's always based on having a life that's so fulfilling that there would be nothing you'd be willing to trade for it. So that's really what we focus on. And, and yeah, it, it's in there. What we're trying to do is really make sure that it's entertaining. We realize that we live in a world where everything's trying to catch your attention every 10 seconds. And for us to be sitting there and being like, hello, welcome back to JRC TV. This week we will talk about blah. Like, that's boring and annoying. I wouldn't watch that. So we try to make it fun. We try to make it entertaining. We try to bring on special guests and interesting people. And our whole goal with that is to take information that I grew up listening to all the adults who could finally afford to go to these seminars saying, I wish I would have known this as a kid. Am I not? Kids are on YouTube. Young people are watching this. Here, have it. Take it. Um, we were just wrote a book about it. We were on YouTube about it. We blog about it. We share it everywhere we possibly can because my thought is if I can give you all the information, that'll be a start. Um, now, the truth is information by itself won't do much in your life except for make you feel smart. <laughs> um, so unless you're doing something with the information, which is the whole point of everything we do, how do we get you information, but how do we get you to use it? So we give worksheets every week. Here's a worksheet. Go do it. Here's a worksheet. Go do it. They're simple things. They can be done in five to ten minutes. But our whole goal is get people into motion so that they can get real results and see life benefit from it. And in your latest book, are there any uh, lesson plans that teacher would, teachers would be able to utilize from that? Um, again, we didn't write it specifically for an educational purpose in classrooms. But we have people from the U.S. Air Force picking it up um, that they're trying to get it on the reading list for the entire um, Air Force and new recruits. Uh, we have education people grabbing it. it. It's something that it takes all the major life lessons of putting your life vision together, everything you'd have to overcome as a person, um, from making sure it's your vision to making sure you know how to get started to jump-starting your plan to all these pieces. And we took real-world right-now examples from Malala to Team Hoyt, fun people that people relate to and connected to, and we mixed all those stories into these lessons to give people the ability to go out and live it and live their life and be a person who lives with purpose. And what would you attribute to be the most important step in achieving any personal or professional goal? Um, making a decision that you believe it's possible. I, I, I've coached people who are at the biggest banks in the world making seven-figure year salaries and all this other jazz, and I've coached people just out of school, just getting started. I have a young man I work with right now who's in Michigan State, and he wanted to start his own business. And I, I worked with him for a few minutes, and we talked about his ideas, and we narrowed one down. And he was thinking of all these like big, crazy, huge things. And I just asked him, I said, what are you really good at? What do you already do right now to make money on the side? What do you love to do? What do you have fun with? And he's like, well, I tutor people. And I was like, why don't you start a tutoring company? And he's like, well, how would that work? And I was like, well, it's not that hard. Here, let me show you. And I connected all the dots for him. And I'll never forget, two weeks later, we had a call. And one of my favorite moments, it almost put a tear in my eye, is he says, oh, my gosh. I already signed up. Like, 10 people in all the local schools are hiring me. And, and they're all telling all their kids about it. And, and I have friends lining up trying to get a job to work with me. And, and, you know, the craziest thing that happened is now I really believe it's possible. Thanks, man. <laughs> so starting with just breaking through and getting the belief that it's possible, whatever your dream is, is, is the best starting point. And do you have any advice that you'd offer to teens um, when they have a difficult time controlling their emotions, rejection, and anxiety? Um, I know it's a very particular, you know, emotional time when you're a teenager. So do you have any advice for them? Sure. Um, understand it's natural. It's normal. And every human being on this planet goes through it, too. You're not alone. You're not different. You're not an outcast. You're not weird. You're not strange. You're just like every other freaking people your age and everyone else. And, and tell you the truth, adults go through the same stuff. I know 65-year-old people who still have tantrums. <laughs> uh, it's not the, my favorite part of their life, but it's interesting. And to realize that it's not unique, it's not special, it's not only me, even though it feels like it sometimes. 
and to really realize everyone's going through it. Uh, we live in a weird culture that everyone's trying to be famous to some extent right now. And it, it's funny. My thought is there's nothing wrong with being famous. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with money as long as you're using it all for the right stuff. You know, get famous off of, like Nick, traveling the world, doing amazing things, building schools, making a difference in the world. Get famous off of being someone who gives and shares and loves and cares versus being famous off of someone who does dumb things or gets addicted to drugs or something else. You know, get famous off of the difference you make in the world in a positive way. And just a couple more questions that I have for you. Um, what are the key steps that you would tell any teen, and I'm guessing you're, you're not going to apply this just to a teen uh, based upon what we're talking about, but what, what are the key steps to starting a business? Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll give you this. First off, not everyone on this planet is meant to start a business. And I, you know, there's entrepreneurship is the new sexy word of the decade right now. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Why? Because Instagram made a billion dollars and Facebook made a billion dollars and so-and-so made a billion dollars and that's the new thing. It's not a million anymore. It's a billion. That's the new target everyone's aiming for. And not everyone on this planet needs to be an entrepreneur. You're welcome to be. Everyone's, it's, it's an open possibility for anyone and everyone if they choose it. But not everyone has to. I'm guessing there's people listening to this who are thinking like, oh, man, I guess if I really want to be successful in life, i got to be an entrepreneur because that's the key to everything, it sounds like. It's not. You can have a job. You can do normal things and be totally freaking happy and fulfilled with your life and be fine. Or you can start a business, you can, you can work for someone else, you can do whatever you want. The key is to be content with what you want to do instead of thinking you need to be doing something else. I'll never forget this. I met a man that changed my whole freaking perspective, and then I'll give you some specifics. Um, I met a man when I was living in that village in Uganda who was the caretaker, the janitor of the clinic, the hospital right next to where I lived. Every single morning, this little man like, went out and swept this little dirt road right in front of the hospital. And I remember I finally went and interviewed him, and I found someone to translate for me because he didn't speak English. And when I asked him, I said, why do you do what you do? And he kind of looked funny and responded funny, and, and, and we finally got through to him. And I said, no, why do you do what you do? And he had this big smile on his face. He said, the reason I do what I do is because I believe every human being, whether the small baby about to enter this world or a sick or elderly person about to leave this world, deserves a clear path to do so. And I remember sitting there being in awe. And meeting a man who did something so simple. Well, I mean, it's a simple job. He swept leaves. He kept the place clean. He took care of it. But he did it with such pride and such ownership and such love and such passion and such meaning that he felt so much purpose in what he did every day that it made him feel truly alive and meaningful and connected to the community and as if he had purpose in this world. I see so many people trying to make a billion dollars, but it's an empty promise. They think, if I can just start that business, if I can just open that company, if I can just make that money, if I can just get to that dream, then everything's going to be amazing. Versus being like, no, how do I fall in love with life in its simplest form? How do I become so grateful and abundant just being around my friends, just being around my family? How do I become content with the beauty of what exists around me right now? And once I'm so fulfilled, then, for fun, just to see what's possible, go out and make your billion dollars. Go out and make, you know, travel the world and go on adventures. And I, I love Nick. I, I'm, I'm very similar. We do volcano boarding and zip lining and skydiving and river rafting and race car driving and everything else. We love that stuff. But we do it not because we think it's going to give us something. We do it just to see what's possible. We are already fulfilled and whole as a person. If I never made another dollar from the day forward, I would be fine. If I never got to take another trip or stand on another stage, I would be fine. Because who I am is content within me. It's not something I'm searching for. Well, I just have one final question for you, Derek. I, I think I could uh, probably talk to you for a long time. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just give my last question, and we'll open it up to everybody else in the panel. Um, when somebody's about to give up, and I know we already talked about you know, that, that we should never give up, what should they do? to really not give up at that point? Find meaning. Um, ask the question, you know, what do you think you're here for? And for sometimes I've been in dark moments in my own life. I've helped plenty of people in very dark and tough moments of their own life when they're feeling like giving up on life. And I remember when I had that moment when I got told I had five days left to live, there are really three choices. 
One, give up. <laughs> Be like, well, that was fun. Oh, well, I'm out. <laughs> Two, um, you know, the cross finger method. Hope things go well. <laughs> or three, uh, find a reason to live and fight like hell. And my belief is if you're trying or you're getting to that point where you feel like, I don't know what I'm here for anymore, you need to find something bigger than yourself to fight for. What's something you're willing to stand up for? What's what, something you're willing to believe in that's bigger than you? That's more important than just you. Because we live in a society, again, where everyone's trying to be famous based on their selfie, based on their Instagram post, based on them. And if you want to be famous, instead of trying to make a million dollars, try to help a million people. And you'll get so caught up in a cause that's so much bigger than you. Eventually, the money will show up as it's needed. Eventually, the fame, the recognition, all that jazz will show up. But if you get committed to helping something and delivering something and being a part of something that's so much bigger than you, you do not imagine the richness that will show up in your life. If you're getting ready to give up, fight for something bigger than you. Figure out what that is. If you want a great example, Google Team Hoyt. The beautiful example of a father who was not in shape, who did not like running, who was not an athlete whatsoever, and because his son showed up in the world in an interesting way, he had to become an athlete for his son. Now they run over 1,000 races. They do the Ironman competition in their 60s and 70s, I think, 50s and 60s now, where his dad pushes him, pulls him, rides him, and tows him in a raft in the two-mile swim. And it's amazing what he does, but he does it for his son. The reverse benefit you never see coming is because he does all this for his son to make his son feel alive, it allows him to stay healthy and alive in return. The beautiful, beautiful circular gift that exists between them. And there's so many examples of that. Malala, she fights for a cause. Women's, you know, everyone's right to have an education. There's a young, passionate woman who's making a very big difference in the world right now. So find something bigger than you to fight for. That was fantastic. Jarek, if you can stay around for a little bit longer, I know we got some some great uh, great stories coming up here, so we'd love to have you be part of it. But thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate you taking the time today. Of course.